Welcome to the third episode in a Legendarium series about the great women of Old England. Today we'll be talking about Balthild of East Anglia. Over her 50-year life, Balthild was a nobleman's daughter, a slave, a queen, the de facto ruler of a country not of her birth, and finally a nun and a Catholic saint. Balthild was born around the year AD 630 to a thane and long-haul master whose name has been lost to history, unfortunately. Being the daughter of an East Anglian thane, the long haul would have been Balthild's world. She would have grown up in a smoke-filled timber hall that housed not only her family, but her father's elite Hearthwaru warriors, and she would have watched as they sang songs of war, as her father gave gifts of gold and silver, and as he feasted, drank, and planned battles with his men. However, Balthild's life would not have been idle. Even nobles were expected to work hard back then, fighting in battles, maintaining their horses and weapons, and helping to expand their wealth. As a girl, Balthild would have learned trades from her mother's side, helping her to weave clothes not only for herself, but making gifts for her father's men. And at least some of those men working alongside Balthild in her father's East Anglian Hall would have been slaves. About 10 to 20 percent of the population of Anglo-Saxon England was enslaved, and people became slaves either by being taken captive in war, sometimes being sold as punishment for a crime, but there were many slaves who had been sold by their own parents because they didn't have enough money to feed themselves through the famine years. Not only did peasant families sometimes see, sell their sons and daughters, but sometimes they were forced to sell themselves. On the other hand, Balthild would have eaten well, feasting not only on bread, venison, and pork, but drinking mead made from honey, spices, and grains. Indeed, the hearths of Saxon halls were often large enough to roast an oxen inside, and they often did. In addition, Balthild would have attended Mass and learned Bible stories, as her parents were recent converts to Christianity. King Sigbert of East Anglia had murdered his pagan brother to take the throne and immediately declared East Anglia a Christian kingdom. And thanes like her father, who wanted to keep their land and their heads, soon followed their new king into Christianity. Now, obviously, the idea of murdering your own brother not only to possess power but over a religious dispute is pretty horrifying to us, for good reason. However, back then, England was a country being torn apart, not only by national and dynastic rivalries, but by religious rivalries as well. Most of the south of England had converted to Christianity by Balthild's time, with the Gospels being brought by Frankish mercenaries, but the north of England would have still been ferociously pagan, and of those pagans, none struck more fear into the hearts of Christians than King Penda the Pagan of Mercia, a fearsome warlord whose many victories not only expanded Mercian power at the expense of his neighbors, but they seemed to signal that God had abandoned the English Christians. In the year AD 641, Penda and his Mercians took advantage of a civil war in East Anglia and invaded the kingdom. Balthild's father probably died in combat, and Mercian troops then seized Balthild, then only 11 years old, and marched her to the coast with dozens if not hundreds of other captives. There they sold her to Danish merchants, who then shipped her across the English Channel to Francia, the name for France back then. Now, such a situation is unimaginable to most people today. However, medieval people tended to accept even the most horrifying of situations as their fate, ordained by God or the gods, and this no doubt shaped Balthild's thinking as she was sold to Archinewald, the mayor of the palace of Neustria. And remember, Neustria was one of the Frankish kingdoms. Francia, much like England, was a country that was split into many different kingdoms. As Balthild started her new life, she would have done the sort of work that she saw slaves do in her father's hall, like hauling firewood and water, tending to animals, washing pots and pans, and scraping and cleaning the floors of spit, spilled beer, urine, and dog droppings. Despite being only 11 years old, Balthild proved to be a hard worker and even helped to keep up the morale of the other slaves. As she entered her teenage years, Archinewald gave Balthild greater responsibility, putting her in charge of managing the other slaves and eventually in charge of running the household. 
As Balthild became a young woman, she attracted her master's favor. Now, according to her hagiographer, Balthild went to great effort to avoid Archinowald's attention and bedchamber, even disguising herself in rags and smearing herself with filth. However, the story of her determination to preserve her virginity can be treated with some skepticism for two reasons. Number one, as her master, Archinowald could force Balthil to do whatever he wanted. And secondly, not long after this incident is said to have occurred, Balthil's owner introduced her to King Clovis II, King of Neustria. Now, obviously, the marriage of a king to a slave is unusual, but like the Anglo-Saxon kings, King Clovis of Neustria wished to marry the daughter of a prominent noble for political advantage. And since Archinowald did not have a daughter of his own, he offered up his trusted slave Balthild, who would have been seen as part of his household or even a part of his extended family. So, the 19-year-old Balthild, just eight years after arriving in Francia, married the 14-year-old King Clovis of Neustria. And if Balthild was pleased at being raised from slave to queen consort, her new husband must have dampened her mood a little. Only five years old when he came to the throne of Neustria, Clovis had degenerated into a pampered, unschooled brat. King Clovis II was often drunk, totally incompetent, and shamelessly forced himself not only upon slave girls, but the daughters of nobility in his palace. Indeed, the tale-tellers of the time said that Clovis even vandalized the reliquary of St. Denis, stealing the saint's arm to place in his own private chapel. Now, despite her husband's appalling weakness, Balthild had three children with him. First, there was Clotar III, then her second son, Childeric, and finally a third son named Thuderic. As queen, Balthild was placed in charge of the royal charities, giving money to the poor both to live up to Christian duties, but also to add to the mystique of the monarchy as being father to the nation. Because of King Clovis II's appalling weakness, Balthild effectively wound up running the country with her former owner, Archinowald. One can only imagine she felt some satisfaction when King Penda of Mercia, the man who had enslaved her 14 years ago, was killed in AD 655. Penda's death marked the death not only of the last great pagan king of Anglo-Saxon England, but it opened the door of northern England to Frankish missionaries bringing the Gospels. Among her other duties, Balthild played a key role in supporting the Augustinian missionaries in England who brought Christianity to the Anglo-Saxons of the north, working with her former master and now political mentor Archinowald to provide funds for the mission evangelizing her home country. One can only imagine that she also felt great relief when her worthless husband Clovis II died in AD 657 at the age of 22. According to the chroniclers, he died in a fit of madness brought about by his vandalizing of the tomb of St. Denis. By the end, according to the tale tellers, he was raving about how if any water touched him, he would be set on fire. And by the time King Clovis II died, he hadn't bathed for weeks and smelled so bad that the slaves had to put handkerchiefs over their faces just to carry him out. And since Balthild's oldest son Clotar was only five years old at the time of King Clovis's death, Balthild and Archinowald became the de facto rulers of Neustria. After spending her whole life in the halls of power, both as a slave and an active participant, Balthild developed sharp political spill skills. She and Archinowald were in agreement on two things. First, Neustria must remain at peace with its neighbors. Second, the monarchy should be strengthened at the expense of the nobles. Balthild had always been a pious Christian, and now she used Christian ritual, patronage of monasteries, and public displays of piety as political weapons. For example, she appointed her supporters as bishops, further strengthening her hand. In addition, she used the Christian duty of assigning her three children godfathers to make men from rival noble families compete for the honor of becoming godfather to either Clotar, Childeric, or Thuderic. And in addition, she used royal funds to help found monasteries, not only out of Christian piety, but also to create power centers that rivaled the nobles. 
And though she became a savvy political operator, Balthild did not forget that she had once been the victim of the slave trade. In Francia, as in Anglo-Saxon England, impoverished peasant families often had to sell their own children to pay taxes or buy seed corn in lean times. Sometimes whole families had to sell themselves into slavery just so that a master would feed them. To prevent this from happening, Queen Balthild lowered taxes on the peasantry. And in addition, she used royal funds to purchase slaves and then give them their freedom. She also enforced laws banning the sale of Christian slaves to non-Christian countries. Her efforts did much to slow the slave trade in France, though it was too deeply entrenched to be ended completely in her lifetime. But it is worth noting that almost 1,200 years before the British Parliament abolished the slave trade, followed soon by the United States Congress, a Queen of France was working to do the very same thing. Later in her reign, Balfield also became a generous patron of several monasteries, especially the Abbey at Shell. However, after her former master Archinewald died, she lost not only a political ally, but a powerful military commander as well. The nobles, disgruntled at how she kept them out of power, helped to install a new mayor of the palace named Ebroin, and in 665 AD, Ebroin removed Balthild from power by force, installed her son Clotar as a puppet king, and she was forcibly retired to a nunnery that she had helped found. With her enemies in power and using her eldest son as a puppet, Balthild resigned herself to quiet retirement in a life of Christian devotion at Shell Nunnery. Prayer and manual labor filled her time for 15 years until her death in 680. And after her death, her hagiographers not only wrote the story of how she escaped Archinewald's attention, but also told of how she had a vision of a ladder descending from the sky to take her to heaven. Another tale told of a bishop who brought a child possessed by a demon to her tomb. And upon seeing the tomb of the holy woman, the child is said to have fallen down, then rose up to cross himself, thank God, and proclaimed himself exorcised of the demon. And around the year 800 AD, she was canonized as a saint by Pope Nicholas I. And that wraps things up for this episode of Channel Legendarium. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you like what you saw, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, please let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.